So at this particular time, I'm going to transition to Dr. Maya Burke Stewart so that she can give you the opportunity to hear some of the data and the findings that she's experienced in her profession, and then we'll come back with question and answer. Thank you. That's fine. Needed to under okay. Needed to understand that the dynamics had changed, and in order to still run a viable, uh, in order to still be productive, in order to still um, be a leader, uh, they had to they had to get on board. Um, so, with that being said, I've got I have to apologize. There's a slide in here that should be here, it's titled, Men Are From Venus, Women Are From Mars. And so the manager said to us, um, do men and women think alike or, or, no, we already know that. We already know men and women don't think alike. We already know, um, well, they know that, you know, we give them their ideas. I'm just joking, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking, seriously. Men are from Venus, women are from Mars. Here's, here's, why men, here's why the author wrote the book and talked about men being from Venus and women being from Mars, and particularly as it relates to governments, particularly as it relates to these kinds of situations where you now have a, a female-led um, city commission or a city council or county commission. Um, the author says that men act on facts and women act on emotion. I think a lot of you know that. The manager asked a question. He said, you know, he talked to his commission and he said to them, you know, he was giving them the numbers. And so he asked you, how many of you think that they were more interested in the numbers? Not many of you raised your hand. And then he's asked you, how many of you think that they were more concerned about the, the, the community and the impact? Most of you raised your hand. That's a clear example. We understand that we are different. We think differently. Um, what's most important sometimes, all of it is important to us, let me say that. But just in terms of how we receive it or how we want to act on it, differs. It differs. Men act on facts, women act on emotions. Men have egos, women have wish lists. Men interact differently than women. Men are more likely to use a dominating um, management style than women are. Women are more likely to use a compromising style than men are. Does that mean that any one is better than the other? No. It's just, it's, it's just a reflection of uh, different styles, different leadership styles, different um, communicating styles, that's all. Here's what we have to do. We have to openly acknowledge gender differences now more than you ever have had to, okay? Now we go to the slide that you see up here. Uh, do men and women speak the same language? Uh, rhetorical, we've already said that. Um, 
men think women ask too many questions. Women often don't feel included, particularly when you're talking about a male-dominated environment. So we go back to, I go back to prior to the city of Lauderdale Lakes um, having a female-dominated uh, commission. It was, I think it was even. I think there were, uh, you had Commissioner Haynes and you had Lavoie, and so, so I think they may have been about even. And I can remember going in and doing a training session, and I, I really, I remember the men being more vocal. I remember them being more uh, demanding. I remember them being more commandeering. I remember them being in control of that meeting. Yeah, and I can see the difference in the women. The women that the female commissioners, I could see them just pushing and fighting to just trying to be heard at the table. I could see that. I could see that. Sometimes the women uh, agreed with what their male counterpart had said, but because he said it and she feels like she needs to be heard, she'll disagree just to raise sand. The manager didn't know that. I'm telling y'all, I didn't tell them that. <laughs> I would see that. I would see that. The tide has changed now. The mayor now in the city of Lauderdale Lakes has five colleagues that he must contend with. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Women often don't feel included, particularly in a male-dominated environment. Men like individual acknowledgement. Women like to be seen as part of the team. Men seek to, men seek recluse to solve a problem. Women seek support. Men communicate less often than females, typically, typically. Productivity in a female-dominated environment. Here's the deal. Irregardless of what you think about you're a female dominated commission. Uh, um, the fact that it used to be all male, the fact that you used to be able to go and, and talk to commissioners such and such whenever you wanted to, the fact that you've been with the city 25 years, the fact, you all see where I'm going, right? So what you may have been used to, I'm not gonna say you have to get unused to it, but you still must be as productive today in this environment than you were yesterday when you had an all-male cast. From a productivity standpoint, you're probably expected to, 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 to be at a thousand percent, whereas it used to be, you know, a hundred percent. Share your feelings. Women tend to be more open and talk more. Men, remember we just said men don't, you know, men aren't, you know, men typically Yes, no, how by? What's the number? Okay. Change it. Okay. Women. <laughs> well, no, we need to have a conversation about why we're changing. And you all know I'm telling the truth. Um, show your softer side. Men. Men. You used to commissioner, you know, such and such, commissioner Bill Johnson, commissioner uh, Ralph Jones, commissioner um, um, Darrell Williams, commissioner um, uh, Jonathan Allen, commissioner. You used to all these men. And so, again, men communicate and interact differently. Now you have commissioner Susie Tyler. Now you have commissioner Beth Williams. Now you have commissioner uh, Aisha um, Levinson. Now you have commissioner Jenny Straw. Female women. Now, that's not to say they don't mean business. I don't, I don't want us to be confused. I'm talking about all these differences between men and women. That's not to say women don't mean business. That's just to say there's been a change in the tides. Call out discriminatory practices. I said this to the mayor. So, so you know, this mayor over in, in the city of Lauderdale Lakes uh, and at the school board, as the city manager has pointed out. So now, you know, Mr. Manager, and I have to tell you, I've never seen this mayor as calm as, as he is. This mayor is a calm mayor. Them women aren't, aren't, aren't playing. He's, he's real calm. He's real accommodating, I've noticed. I've said this. I've joked with them, teasing them. Mr. Mayor, you awfully relaxed now. You, you got an all-female cast. You awfully relaxed. He just laughs. I know what the mayor want to say. They're not going to let me do anything else. 
<laughs> I know what the man want to say. Um, but I also said to the commission in talking to them, uh, you can't be discriminatory just because you are a majority. You can't now make a man feel like what you felt like all these years. That's not how we do it. Now, you know they're doing it, right? You know that's exactly what they do it, right? But I said to them, we cannot discriminate. You know, you felt closed out for so many years. You felt, you know, that men have ruled uh, on the commission for so many years. And so now it's a female majority. And so now you don't want the mayor to say nothing. You all sit him over in a corner and you, and you, and you rule the world. No, that's not, you know, that's, that's not how, that's how it works at home. But in the commission chambers, I'm just saying. But in the commission chambers, we can't do that. Um, being the only male uh, can become one-sided. And I've, to think, I've seen it become one-sided. Uh, take pride in your work. Some tasks may seem female-oriented. This is talking to, you know, men. Some tasks may seem female-oriented. And even women, I'm, some of us women, some of us women are, you know, we're so strong and, you know, we do. We have these um, um, masculine or, or dominant, you know, mentalities. We rule, because we rule the world, we do. And so sometimes we bring that into the workplace. Sometimes, you know, we have to tone it down. I've said this to the, to the you know, to the manager and to his staff. You know, we were having a conversation and they say, well, I'm used to it. And, and well, you know, my style, Here's the difference. Your style, that's fine, but you still report to the commission. So your style must match theirs, not the other way around. Your style has to match theirs. I know you've been here 30 years. Emotional intelligence, so, so emotional intelligence is the ability to be aware of, name, and manage one's emotions, your own. Emotional intelligence. In corporate, we talk about this, you know, often in corporate, we lack emotional intelligence. When you talk about the dollars, when you talk about the bottom line, when you talk about, you know, a, a global operation, nobody care about your feelings. In the public sector, however, Again, you're talking about an elected body. You're talking about a commission or a council. Makes more of a difference. Uh, emotional intelligence, the ability to be aware of, name, and understand others' emotions. And so now you're saying, ain't nobody paying me to be a, well, no. But it's the public sector, and it's about public service. It's about uh, sharing and communicating and giving back. It's about protecting, preserving, identifying. And so we do have to be more in tune to others' uh, emotions, others' feelings. It's the public sector. It's a different, this is a different environment. When it comes to emotional intelligence, you must have the ability to relate to others in effective ways, both personally and professionally, in a wide range of contexts and roles. So what are you saying, Dr. Stewart? That means that the minute somebody make you mad, she's laughing because you already know. That means that the minute somebody, what we say, P.O. you, no, you can't give them a piece of your mind. First of all, stop giving folk a piece of your mind because the more you give away, the less you have. <laughs> the more you give away. So stop giving folk a piece of your mind. It's about managing our own emotions. It's about managing how we respond to others. It's about that, uh, uh, what's that, that woo-sa? Mm-hmm, woo-sa or biting your tongue, or holding your breath, or all these other different, you know, methods that we use or we come up with. Emotional intelligence. That's how you know when you've grown in the game. That's how you know when you have grown in the game. When you're able to, when you're at a point where, where you don't automatically feel like you have to give folk a piece of your mind. But you're able to stop before you think. Because remember, once we put it out there, we can't take it back, whatever that is. 
And so the manager gave an example of years ago when Barrington, um, uh, the, the, the mayor Barrington Russell was on the economic development just on an advisory board and he was the public works director. And then Barrington Russell became the, uh, the a city, city commissioner. The manager had interact with them. Then Barrington Russell became the mayor. And so, you know, he said his exact words was, you know, had I have behaved any differently then, you know, my experience would, would, would be different today. No, you'd be fired. <laughs> Wouldn't be no experience. Or that would be the experience. That would be the experience. And so understanding how to manage your emotions, understanding the importance of um, uh, communicating with, the, with folk effectively. It'll save your job, too, whether we know it or not. Emotional intelligence. <clears throat> the importance of emotional intelligence um, at work. It helps to manage stress. Yep, when we can, you know, bite our tongues a bit, you know, think about it before we say it. Yeah, that helps us more than it does them. Uh, it's vital for enhanced cooperation and teamwork. It helps us to learn in relationships. It determines how well you succeed. I just said that. It shows good faith, a good faith effort in building and maintaining healthy relations relationships, and it helps us to develop and grow professionally. If nothing else, if nothing else, when we talk about emotional intelligence, when we talk about being able to manage our emotions, um, it helps us just personally and professionally. I had a young lady that worked in my office. Um, she, she had worked in New York when Lehman Brothers was around. She worked for Lehman Brothers. She had worked for Bear Stearns. She had worked for VP. She worked at a, a very high and executive level. And I remember in interviewing her and I said to her, uh, she said, well, Dr. Stewart, um, you know, what is it that you expect in, uh, in terms of the job? Now, I was headed to Tallahassee to go and, and do some networking, go and do some mingling. You know, that's how we make our money, influencing others to, to, to give us stuff. And so I needed, you know, someone fairly quickly to bring them on board so that they can schedule those trips, have me sit down with representatives such and such, yada, yada. She said, well, Dr. Stewart, what do you, you know, what do you expect? I said to her, if you can manage me, then you can run my whole office. Meant that. If you can manage me, and so I'm saying to her, if you can manage me, if you can understand me, if you can flow with me, if you can get ahead of me, you all interact with directors and with commissions and with, and with mayors. If you can manage them, you can manage what you need to do. You can manage what you do. Now, don't record this and show them I'm talking about managing them, but that's, real, that's what it is. When we can manage other folk then, we can work better. Now manage don't mean control, there's a difference. I ain't told you to go out here and try and control nobody. I don't, not, I don't have any openings. I'm not hiring them for a lot of deals, so don't go and set yourself up. But I said to her, if you can manage me, then you can run my entire operation. Emotional intelligence. Here's how you know when you are low in emotional, in in emotional intelligence. Here's how you know. You blame others. Uh, you make victim statements. If only he, if only she, ooh, if only she, she looked like, if only she, uh, you have an inability to hear critical feedback. We don't want to hear someone else tell us what we uh, not necessarily have done wrong, but how we can improve because we've been with the city 30 years. None you can tell me. I've been with the city 20 years, 25 years, 15 years. I've been, I've, I've, I know this. I've done this. Here's how you know when you are low in emotional intelligence. Diverse opinions that are not welcomed or valued. You don't receive thoughts and ideas from others. Uh, passive, uh, aggressive or passive aggressive communication. We're rough when we're communicating with others. We're pushy, we're dominant. 
um, leaders who do not listen and become out of touch with those they lead. Here's how you know when you are low in emotional intelligence. And so not just you, here's how you know when others are low in emotional intelligence. All right, so with all that being said, Dr. Stewart, what? We need to communicate and we need to communicate effectively uh, as a result of the new norm as the manager has described it. How do we do that, Dr. Stewart? When you have a clear understanding of issues, when you refuse to answer first and think later, when you are open to reaching a consensus, when you show genuine effort towards buy-in, when you engage in active listening, when you use constructive criticisms, and when you provide fair and balanced responses, you're on the road to communicating effectively. Now there's a difference between, there's a, so, so, so in business, as, as a university perfect, professor, I teach uh, 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 international business, entrepreneurship, and uh, management courses. And so in all of those courses, we talk about leadership. And so I'll stand before the class and I say, so here's what leaders are. Here's what leadership is. And so I'm talking, I'm talking, and nobody has caught on to the fact that, that I said nothing about effective leadership that says effective communication we all communicate because I'm talking now you all will be talking amongst each other when we leave here that's communicating we are gonna be talking over each other at some point trying to get our point across that's communicating effective communication is when we stop and listen is when we're open to other ideas. Here's what you like about public, the public sector. Here's what you like about the public sector. Uh, unlike the private sector, this room is a clear example of the diversity. The diversity, the background, the diversity in culture, in race, in ethnicity, in religion, in skills. The diversity. Inevitable. Effective communication. This is how we effectively communicate. We share constructive feedback. When I'm talking to, I teach PhD and MBAs. And so, you know, nobody has an ego quite like an, an MPA. I mean, an MBA. Nobody has an ego quite like an MBA. We think we all that and a bag, bag of chips. And so, when I'm speaking to folk who are, you know, in the MBA class, I have to say things like, you know, Jim, you did an outstanding job. I think that your interpretation of, of, of how China incorporate barriers from a global standpoint is spectacular, you know, because it's an MBA, so I've got to use all these big words, and I, I've got to speak to him, and I've got to make sure that I don't crush his ego. I've got to make sure that I don't speak down to him. I've got to make sure that I am encouraging him. And so we all have to do that. One of the things, and, and the, if the manager don't mind me sharing, one of the things that uh, the manager's executive staff shared during our session, they said uh, the commission, they thought that the commission uh, did not like them. They, the exact words was they hate us. This is staff. They talk down to us. They, they demean us. Can you imagine from a productivity standpoint? Remember, because I say this. I say this even in my office. Your check does not involve what you feel. It's not about how you feel. It's, it's not about what you think about others. None of your check, no, not a fourth, not a quarter, not a half, not a tenth of your check is, is, is a portion being paid uh, to, to, uh, to feel a certain way or to treat people a certain way, demean. None of your check is for that. Productivity, being productive, being productive, being encouraging, being forward thinking, okay? Barriers to communicating effectively. Here are some of the barriers that will cause you not to uh, be able to communicate effectively within your department and with your city council. Your natural ability to communicate or lack thereof. Some of us are 
what do we call it, uh, 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 overts, co-overts, that's the in internal. I'm an MBA, I don't, you know, that psychology stuff, y'all. Uh, introvert, there, yeah, that's it, introvert. Some of us are introverts. Um, uh, your interpretation of communication. I've already given us an example of what, how we effectively communicate. So your interpretation has now been changed if, as of two minutes ago. Uh, ego, stereotyping and prejudice, poor listening skills, carrying negative attitudes forward, which is one of the things I said to this existing commissioner. So you know, remember I, I said, you know, I could see them in the meeting when, when, the, when the strong men warned the commission. I could see them in the meeting. You know, they agree with what Commissioner, you know, Holness has said, but, you know, just because he's a male and they've ruled for so long, they go against the grain. And so now, you know, there was a bullet that talked about um, not discriminating. And so now because you are a majority, that does not mean that you get to push others. You get to push the poor mayor around. Stereotyping, um, prejudice, carrying negative attitudes forward. What you felt about your previous commission, you can't bring that into today's environment. Inability to, inability to uh, direct or govern a business meeting, uh, for those of us that are directors, for those of us that have to meet with the commission or meet with the mayor pretty often, and lack of trust. These are some of the things that's gonna cause you to not be able to do your job at a premium. And we all know what a premium is, right? Those of us that have phone service with Verizon, that's a premium. Used to be AT&T, now it's Verizon, all right? These are barriers to communication. These are some of the things that will cause you to not be able to um, make the adjustments that you need in this new normal. Communication styles, now here's what you need to know about your city council and, and ourselves and your colleagues. We all have different communication styles. There are communication styles. So Dr. Stewart, where do you get that from? So, you know, Dr. Stewart does a little research, and I particularly did for this presentation. Um, there are four type four different communication styles that are that are that are hottest. You know, you know how we evolve and so one author or, or one theorist will say something and so you know we run Darwinism is today and then Darwinism goes away and then uh, Maslow comes in, then Maslow you, you all know how we progress. So right now the hottest on the street are the four styles that I'm gonna talk about now. Sensors, feelers, intuitors and thinkers. Your commission, your city council falls into one of these four categories. Sensors, sensors are action or result oriented. They are technically skilled, they are practical, they are decisive. Feelers, feelers are people oriented, spontaneous, empathetic, judgmental, and persuasive. Intuitors, intuitors are future oriented, conceptual, innovative, idealistic, and creative. Last but not least, thinkers. Thinkers are logical, organized, objective, detailed, and analytical. All right, so think about your city council right now. Think about each other, those in your department that you must communicate with right now. Size them up. Who are the thinkers? Who are the feelers? Who are the intuitors? Who are the sensors? Little something about sensors. Sensors are energetic and action oriented. They are direct and down to earth. They work on a variety of tasks at one time. They demonstrate incredible attention to detail. They often ask, will it work? How? Who will do what? They assess growth and progress in specific and measurable terms. They place high value on actions. They thrive on getting things done. Sensors, this is a little something about sensors. Right, because you have one of these or two of these or several of these on the council or in leadership positions that you must or may report to. 
intuitors. Here's a little something about intuitors. Intuitors enjoy tasks and situations that demand a long-term view. Intuitors accept that disorder and chaos are inevitable. Intuitors place a high value on ideas, innovations, and concepts. Intuitors, uh, per, uh, others perceive intuitors as hard to pen down. Intuitors tend to challenge. Intuitors probe and ask a lot of questions. Thinkers. Thinkers rely on observation and rational principles. They avoid emotionalism. So are we talking about men or women when we do that first one? Men, raise your hand. If, it, if we're talking about men, raise your hand. If we're talking about women, raise your hand. Valued for prudent and thoughtful analysis. They're very objective. They're skeptical. They want to sleep on it. You all have all had that one, you know, that one person. Well, no, I, you know, I don't want to make that decision today. Let me sleep on it. Uh, thinkers, high value on logic, objectivity, and systemic inquiry. Little something about thinkers. Feelers, last but not least, feelers are dynamic, stimulating, and warm. They read nonverbal clues extremely well. They show sensitivity to needs and wants of others. They are effective in, particip and in anticipating the ways others may respond to change. They value personal experience and harmony. They understand um, and are attentive. They are understanding and attentive to others. Uh, they notice subtle changes in others' mood. Feelers. How many feelers do you know? How do you recognize a sensor? Dependable, wants to get to the point, prefer to call on the phone rather than write, make short, abrupt gestures with hands, eyes jump from object to object, constructively impatient, direct in dialogue, easily made impatient, and usually running behind schedule. We don't know nobody like that. Sensors. Here's how sensors behave under stress. In stressful moments, here's how a sensor behaves. Tries to resolve things quickly, does not ask enough questions. They command, uh, not taking time to learn others' objectives. They come on too strong. They overwhelm. They talk too fast. Uh, they're overcompetitive and, and being proud to a fault. Little patience. They have little patience with rambling dialogue. How do you recognize an intuitor? An intuitor asks big picture type questions. They have an excellent imagination. They relate to, they relate two different trends to each other. They overgeneralize. They make frequent references to future events. They tend not to use examples. They keep social distance. They keep their social distance. They expect their actions to be understood. Uh, they present insights, concepts, and ideas first. Little something about intuitors. Intuitors under stress. This is how intuitors behave under stress, in stressful environments, under stressful moments. Comments are scattered. They raise too many issues. The, they are too lengthy. They appear rigid, appears too judgmental. They can be condescending, and they leave issues dangling. We don't know anybody like that. How do you recognize a thinker? Thinkers write letters in outline form. They're neat and orderly in their work habits, offer more detail than one may feel necessary. They're specific in their choice of words. They're consistent producers. They're results oriented. Thinkers. Here's how a thinker behaves under stress. Over explain, they become too non-committal. They're very monotone. They do not express their feelings enough. They get involved in asking too many questions. They want to organize in too rigid a fashion. They give people more background than they really want. I didn't say need than they really want. We've all, we've all been there. Thinkers under stress. Feelers. How do you recognize a feeler? Use your name in the course of conversation or letters. Belinda. I sent an email to you during uh, the commission meeting. 
feelers. Uh, they close. They use close eye contact. Uh, they will physically touch you when making a point. Put the hand on the shoulder. Yeah, but remember, if you know, we talked about reducing a budget, and and we said that if we borrowed money, feel her. Values harmony and often defends the action of others. Keeps plants and personal pictures in their office. Yes, feelers do. Um, yes, feelers do. Under stress. Um, is thin-skinned, emotional, and overreactive. Do we know any feelers? I do. Here's how feelers behave under stress. They're moody. They talk too much about the past and tell too many anecdotal stories. Now, 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 I don't know if you have this on your council, but I know you've sat on boards where folk come from somewhere else. and they're, Well, what we used to do well, here's how we did it. Well, when I was with such and such, oversimplifies and forgets to cite facts, never gets to the point, avoids bringing to the surface unpleasant facts, uses self-pity as a crutch, and overreacts. This is how feelers behave in stressful environments under stressful moments. Each of these communication styles has a very specific uh, uh, method of overusing their strength. Intuitors, they're abstract, unrealistic, far out, idealistic, and impractical. Thinkers, they're overcautious, rigid, indecisive, and slow. Feelers, too casual, subjective, sentimental, soft. Sensors, overpowering, impulsive, short-sighted, and narrow. Well, Dr. Stewart, why are you sharing all of this? Remember, you have a new normal. You still must produce, even though you have a female-dominated commission and it may count city council and it may have been male-dominated at one point. You're still expected to perform. You're still expected to perform uh, at optimal level. So perhaps. If we understand who we're dealing with, if we know who we're dealing with, perhaps we can change our style to better communicate and interact with those individuals. Note, these styles may change under stress. So everything I just talked about. And under stress, I showed you or, or identified some of the behaviors that we could probably see. Now, depending upon, depending, depending upon the level of stress, an economic downturn, you might want to th magnify that by three. So let's pray for no economic downturns. Adapting to communication style. So here is how... You, because each of your councils and because your directors and because you have a different communication style, they're very particular behaviors. They're very particular uh, ways that we can um, adapt to each style in the same way. So instead of saying, okay, councilman such and such is this, but councilman such and such is a feeler. So when I go over here to councilman such and such, I'm going to say this. But when I go over to councilman, you're going to go crazy. Here's some of the ways that when having a conversation with all of them at one time or with them in a one-on-one -on -one individual, here's some of the ways that we can come across as um, accommodating. We come across as understanding. We come across as Particip participating, we come across as wanting to support, understanding our role. Can we discuss, you ask the question, can we discuss item or can we discuss the budget or can we discuss personnel changes? Can we discuss? I'm comfortable with such and such. I'm comfortable with the change in staff. I'm comfortable with if we were to borrow. I'm comfortable with if we were to purchase. This is how I perceive. 
Councilwoman, this is how I perceive what you said, or this is how I perceive how we will grow, or this is how I perceive what how we will be uh, inhibited, or this is how this is how I perceive. Nobody's offended. You don't have to to memorize every particular communication style. I understand what you're saying. Can we? So you're saying, I understand what you're saying, Councilwoman. I understand what you're saying, Councilman. I understand what you're saying, Director. Is it possible for us to, or can we take a look, or can we examine? How do you think we should? Because when you open up, when you start out with, I understand what you're saying, that's buy-in. And so now your boss understands that you've, you know, you've already bought in. They've already, they've already been able to achieve the buy-in. So now how do we make it happen, whatever that discussion is about? Can we all agree? What was that uh, um, um, Rodney King, can't we all just get along? Can't we, can we all agree to... Can we all agree to come back? Can we all agree to table this item and communicate with staff on? Can we all agree that staff will provide us with? How does this sound, Councilwoman, such and such? What if we were to? Now, here's what I said to, to the manager and to his staff. You know, the manager gave an example of when folk are elected and they are an activist. And so now you have an activist who has been out in the community, you know, walking and knocking on doors and showing up at the PTA. Not that this person is invaluable. Or they may have been, you know, a stay-at-home mom, and so they'll take the kids and they go out and they pass out information about, you know, the, the, the parks or, um, you know, area beautification or the activist. And so the activist now becomes a councilwoman or a councilman. Balancing your budget is different than balancing uh, your checkbook. Some similarities, meaning you can't bounce no checks either way. But there is a difference, big difference. How does this sound? Can we look at it from this point of view? Can we look at it from this point of view? Can we, can we talk about it from the standpoint of, can we share with, so all of these forms, all of these approaches, every one of them, whether you're a thinker, a feeler, a sensor, or an intuiter, you'll come across as um, uh, um, you'll come across as receiving, you'll come across as supporting, you'll come across as understanding, you'll come across as uh, ready to assist. Managing communication conflict between sexes. How do you manage a communication conflict? Men, because now there is a predominantly female uh, city council and you've been with the city 20 years, how do you avoid conflict with the city council or particular city council women because now they don't do it the way it used to be done? You don't, you can't go and sit down with kids, uh, councilwoman such and such or councilwoman such and such. She always touching. Feelers. They're happy. They have plants in the office. They might have your picture in the office too. Um, Frame the conflict. How do we frame the conflict? Naming, explaining, blaming, claiming. Naming, what is the conflict? Explaining, how do I explain the conflict? Blaming, how am I assessing blame? Claiming, who owns it? Frame the conflict. How do I manage conflict? between? How do I make sure that, that I can uh, communicate with my counsel 
effectively? How do I make sure that I don't offend them? How do I make sure that my council members know that I'm here to support them? How do my, I make sure that my council knows that I'm not bringing old baggage into this new environment because I've been with the city for so long. Manage the tone of delivering and responding. How do you manage conflict? With anybody. Because the minute you raise your voice, what happens? Start giving folk a piece of your mind, what happens? Takes it to a whole nother level. And so now everybody's raising their voice. And remember, whether we like it or not, we work for the council, not the other way around. So raising our voice is probably not a good thing to do. Uh, and vice versa. I had to say this to, to the manager's council. Raising your voice. Remember, even, even I, you know, I talked to us about our paychecks. Even as elected officials, nobody elected you to come in the building and be demeaning folk and talking down to folk and raising your voice at folk. Nobody elected you for that. They want you to make sure that communities are clean, budgets are balanced, services are provided. That's what they want you to do. Um, seek common ground, empathize when necessary. Recognize underlying interests, redefine or change focus of the problem, avoid escalation. How do I manage conflict between sexes? How do I, how do I make sure that I don't cause a conflict with my director or with the council? And how do I make sure that I avoid conflict with them? Some ideas. All right. Now the manager's gonna come back and uh, talk about some uh, top takeaways, some of the things uh, between what I have described and talked about and what he has. Um, he's going to suggest some very poignant and particular takeaways for us. Can we give her a round of applause? You know, I, I hope this is, has been beneficial to you. While um, Dr. Stewart was over there talking, I mean, I thought that at some times when I'm at the city commission meeting or the workshop room, and I had an opportunity to go to the room over there, that, you know, there's always the room where you take the beating before you come over here, and that seemed to be that room. So that's why I got my coffee and I left real quickly because, <laughs> you know, I felt the tension up in there. But there, there are... Um, some important C's that I want you to, to leave with, and I think that they're very important. You know, Maya Angelou participated in a master's class for Oprah Winfrey, and Oprah was having a challenge within her life where she was experiencing a lot of comments from critics and um, individuals where she, what she thought to be close friends, you know, they had portrayed her and she called Dr. Maya Angelou for some advice. And Dr. Maya Angelou, speaking the way she speaks, says, baby, those people can't hold a candle to the light that God is shining on you. And sometimes you're gonna be in experience, I mean, you're gonna experience things in your professional career and you have to remember those types of lessons in which Dr. Maya Angelou gave um, Oprah. And then I also have in my office a um, plaque, and it talks about the critic. And Theodore Roosevelt said that it is not the critic who counts, not the man or woman who points out how strong a man or woman stumbles or where the doer of deeds have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or the woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, and comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. And so what we are presenting to you is a trend, but you have to make it work for yourself in the city of Austin and the organizations in which you deal with. 
And I think that the important C's that I want you to take away is that you have to have the ability to adapt your overall communication skills. I mean, what may have worked in getting certain items through in the past, you may have to adapt, tweak your communication skills as you move forward. Also, you have to use common sense. I mean, Dr. Maya gave me some ways in which I could react to questions. Is this being taped? Is it? Okay, so I got to clean up my language. To questions that I think that I may be asked when I'm sitting up there that may be just create up stupid questions. And I have to sit there and says, I have to say, Madam Commission, that was a good idea. Uh, that was a good question. Could you repeat it? And I've discovered that if I just insert that transition in there, it gives me an opportunity to react in an intelligent way to a question that was just just straight off the chart. And that is the communication skills or the common sense that you have to use as a public administrator. You have to redirect some of the challenges that will be coming your way. And those challenges don't always come from the elected officials. Sometimes they come from the members of the public or the advisory board that you have to deal with on a daily basis. And then you have a commitment to excellence, which is very important because the standard does not change whether you're a male public administrator or whether you're a female public administrator or whether you're a male city council member, mayor, or a female council member. member. So you want to have your professional standards at their highest. And so you have to have a commitment to excellence, a caring spirit, character, confidence, connections, collaborations, and change management. Let me talk about connections. I can recall on a Friday, we had our executive session and I had all of my senior staff meetings. We went to a prominent hotel in Fort Lauderdale and, you know, we were really feeling good. And we were talking about what we needed to do to connect with the commission. And, you know, me, I'm saying I'm not going to the neighborhood association meeting or there was a community garden session the next day, the Saturday. And my commission, they're really into community gardening. They call it urban gardening. Me. I do my community garden at Publix or Winn-Dixie. I go in the grocery store, I get my tomatoes, and I'm fine. But, you know, they like to till the land and get the fertilizer and all that type of stuff. And so we talk about the importance of connections. And I say, you know, I'm just not the gardening type. I'm not going over there. Y'all give me the update on Monday morning. I'm, I'm just not going to be there. But Dr. Maya encouraged me to go to a community garden where I knew the uh, event where I knew majority of my elected officials were there. And so I went there and they had the squash, Dusty, they had the squash in the bowl. I'm not going to eat that. They had the tomatoes that they had picked and I'm going and well, show me your tomatoes. I'm, you know, I'm literally trying to make connections here. And so I went through all of that. I paid my money. I didn't eat anything. But the next Monday, they were talking about the connections that the city manager had made. He came out. He was among the people. And I was like, if I would have known that, I would have done it a long time ago. <laughs> So that is the importance of making that connection. And that connection was almost like making a deposit in, a, in an emotional piggy bank. And you are literally making deposits. When I was in the male dominated, I mean, we had the opportunity to discuss issues. We may argue and they may forget about it and we may go out afterwards. And my female dominated commission you know, when they get emotional and they get me mad, they, they may hold on to it for a little while. So it's like, don't come to me this week. So I, I give them their overall space. But that is what I have to deal with as a manager if I want to be effective. We talked about the feeler. Sometimes when I need an extra vote, I have to go up to my elected officials and I may have to put a hand on their shoulder, let them know that I really understand the position that they're in. 
And I went and I spoke to Mrs. Williams or Mrs. Perez and I brought them to my office and they really understand the position. So all I need you to do is vote in favor of this and we will be able to meet the needs of the community. That's what I have to do in the new normal environment. In the old environment, I would have been able to pull out a spreadsheet, show the numbers, show that we can afford it and show that the overall interest was low and the return on investment was high. And that would have been what I needed to do in the old environment to get an item through. So you must be able to adapt your communication style, your management style to be most effective. And that's how you evolve as a public administrator because the environment will continue to change. Right now, we're talking about the dynamic of women leaders. You may have more minorities in whatever population come to prominence and come to leadership roles. And at that particular time, you must be prepared to make a shift. But the good thing about being a public administrator is, is that we have prepared ourselves to make shifts. Policy decisions, priorities, they change from time to time. So you must reorient yourself to the top priority of the commission. And it may occur in two year election cycles. It may occur in four year election cycles. It may occur in shorter election cycles. But you must be prepared to adapt your professional development skills to meet the era of the day. And so if there any if there is anything that I want to leave with you and if Dr. Maya wants to leave with you is that you are in a, flu, a very fluid career that you have to be prepared to address changes within your organizations, but most importantly, in your overall body of work. And as long as you understand that, I think that you will be ahead of the curve in terms of making sure that you are developing as a career professional and making sure that your organizations, whatever unit that you're in, that you're making progress. And I also say that I mean, this is a great career. Public administration, to me, is the greatest career that I could have ever chosen. I mean, whether it would be in the city manager's office, whether it was in the public works department, whether it was in parks and recreation, I honestly felt that I was making a difference. And if you go in to my office right now, there would be a plaque on the top of my desk that says, work like you don't need the money. Because if you're doing the work and you're making a difference, there is no value of compensation that anyone could pay me for making a difference within my community. So I leave that on behalf of Dr. Burke Stewart. I want to thank you for inviting us to um, present to you. I hope that something that we said was helpful. And at this particular time, we'll open it up for any questions that you might have. Any questions? Yes. I'm, I'm going to let Dr. Stewart handle that, but let, but, but, let, but, 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 but let me say that. <laughs> I, I heard someone say that when your opponent is on fire, you throw gasoline. But when your friend is on fire, you throw water. As a city manager, I mean, I've, I've been taught by an old mentor that you don't let your commission spin its wheels. And so if there's a policy decision, it's a discussion that's being uh, in the um, overall public arena, if you can help them by interjecting, you try to interject. So to me, if it's going to be to my advantage and the discussion is going to tire them out and then in the end I can swoop in with the proposal, I use that to my advantage. So I yet let that fighting go on until the end. In fact, and most recently, you said this is being taped. 
It's been taped. So, so most recently, we were having a, poli- a, a high-level policy discussion, and it was getting late in the hour. And so, I mean, I walk up, and we're in a room like that. I get up, and I go to the restroom, and I walk in the back where the executive staff sits in the back, and, you know, they're, like, concerned. You know, this particular discussion is getting off base. I don't know if they're going to be able to arrive at the decision. You had the arguing back and forth. But to me, I said to myself, it's getting late. And when it's getting late, they're going to get tired. <laughs> and when they're going to get tired, it's toward the end where they're going to make a decision in a short period of time. So in that case, the management skill in me say, let it go on. Madam Commissioner, do you have another question? Do you want to have the other question? <laughs> So then you start asking questions like that so that they can get back and forth and back and forth. And then I just swoop in with the solution and swooping in with the solution at the last minute is the last decision that they want to make before this mayor says I adjourn the meeting. So in that case, it was a great decision for them to have conflict back and forth. But I'm just giving you just the tactic that may be used from time to time, not necessarily in my city, because I'm just talking, talking out of turn <laughs> for the public. By way of communicating or interacting with you, you come a certain way, same mannerism, same demeanor, same, you know, you, you approach folk in a certain way. Sometimes we can tend to bring folk down, you know, uh, cause them to just bring it down a notch. You've gone in where folk just, and, and me, just raising hell, just, just. And you come in just as calm, like, Dr. Stewart, I understand that you're upset, so... Would you like to? But now look at where I'm going. How do you think we should? Look at, look at where I'm going. Remember I said there's a certain way that we can ask questions. There's a certain way that, that we can communicate that causes you to kind of command the room. And so your role would be to not necessarily, you know, handle them or handle that, but what is it that you need to accomplish? How then do you ensure that you are poised and positioned to interact with that person? And so certainly not feeding into. So the manager said, you know, when you, the enemy you, on fire, you throw gas. But, but I'm just going to say just the opposite. Not throwing gas on it by not feeding into those behaviors. And so, you know, a lot of times, even in, in, in the uh, uh uh, private sector, you know, when folks say something because we won't buy in and because we want that friendship and because we want a certain vote, we tend to, you know, start talking about such and such hair too. Or, you know, we talk about somebody else's shoes because councilman such and such talking about the shoes or the director talking about the shoes. No, don't feed into it. I said this to the manager and I said this to, to uh, the vice mayor and to when the new members come on. Just because a, a certain colleague feels a certain way doesn't mean that you have to feed into that same thing because now you're talking about a whole environment that's toxic you stay away from it 
whatever that is, you make sure that you stay away from it. Someone makes, sometimes it's, it's awkward. Someone makes a, a comment, well, such and such, Susie, this director over there in human resource, and every time I turn around, it seems like we've got problems over in HR. She can't do nothing right. What are you, you don't have to comment on that. You know, well, I think it's important that you remain neutral. And let me, use, let me see if I can use this example. I find that the elected officials are going to protect the institution. So you don't want to take sides. I see time and time again where an officer may go to a domestic dispute. The female may have made the 911 call. The police officer arrives. The police officer approaches the individual in which she calls them on. And based on that interaction, she jumps in and say, oh, he messing with my husband now. Or he messing with my boyfriend. And then it switches. So both of them ended up turning on the individual in which they call to help them in the situation. So you have to be careful that in those types of situations where you have the bickering back and forth, that you remain neutral so that they won't accuse you of taking one side being disrespectful. Because if you're interpreted as being disrespectful, they are going to protect the institution of the office. Does that make sense? So um, coming in after the situation has occurred, maybe allowing it to diffuse itself and then going to them individually with the same message would be the overall approach that I would handle the bickering back and forth. But don't let them turn all of their directions on you and they forget why they were bickering in the first place. Yes. So our mayor knows how to get along with women. Like I said, he's got three daughters. Um, but just, uh, I just want to make a comment and then ask a question. Sure. So being in the mayor's office, um, there's a lot of pressure right now on mayor and council. And I just ask everybody to be patient. And we're all trying to figure out each other's communication styles. And I, I have a lot of supervisor experience, so I know that this is not unusual, that nobody's doing anything wrong intentionally. It's just that this is what happens with the storming, norming. This is part of the process of trying to understand each other. Uh, so my first thing is please be patient with us as we are trying to figure out our roles. I was telling somebody the other day, we're just trying to get on the bike right now. We're not quite on the bike so that we can move forward. So that's my comment. So I would like to ask you, I mean, I would like to ask um, for an organization that has a lot of change. I mean, just think about in the mayor's office, we have a whole bunch of new people who have never worked together. Yeah. We have a whole council that's never worked together. We have all these council offices. We're talking about lots and lots of people who are brand new in roles. Any kind of recommendations for the change management component that you were talking about when you have a whole bunch of people starting to do a whole bunch of work um, together for the first time. Okay. <clears throat> Let me tell you how it is in my organization, and I'm going to give you what I suspect it is in your organization. When you have individuals coming to a governing body at one time, it takes time for them to learn the overall process. I just had one individual come to mind, and the city attorney and I were having a conversation, and he says that, you know, we will be at the new normal probably six months from now. And we do that every year just when someone changes the position from commissioner to vice mayor. It takes them six months to get used to the new role. And after they get used to the new role and they've gotten their new shirts and they've gotten their badges to say vice mayor, someone else is about to be elected into that role. So it does require patience. Most importantly than patience, it requires what I call continuous teaching moments where the elected official is being taught how to effectively operate in their position and staff, city manager's office, public administrators, department directors, assistant department directors, on down, you are being taught how to negotiate the overall learning experience. It occurred that way in the city, I mean, not in the city, but in the state legislature when we went to term limits in Florida. 
where previously individuals were there. They probably had 20 years of service. I mean, they became institutions with the organization, I mean, within the state agencies. And that was beneficial to a lot of municipalities because many individuals were former elected officials at the local level. They became city commissioner, county um, commissioner, and then they moved up to the state level. Now they have to turn over every four, or every eight years. And so when you get there your first year in office, you are already campaigning to be Speaker of the House. And you have to do something drastic to get your name out there to position yourself for a leadership position. So fast forward to this particular situation where you had new individuals coming to the commission, not only the mayor has a steep learning curve, but you have other elected officials have a steep learning curve, and you put that in the dynamic of now they have to get along with one another. So you have the interactions that they're learning with staff and then the interactions that they're learning with one another. So my experience of one new commissioner, six months, if you had, I think someone told me you had more than four, how many? How many new? Ten new? Okay, so, so listen to this. So you have 10 new with the mayor. So when it would take me six months for everyone to get on board, you double that. I mean, you, you, you literally doubled that because, I mean, let's face it, the city of Austin is a large organization in comparison to other jurisdictions. And you really don't have that significant amount of turnover where probably I understand the mayor didn't necessarily come up through the process. And what I mean is that they wasn't a prior elected official before coming to the office of mayor. So that adds to the overall learning curve. And when you come to a position, you have to get comfortable with individuals. So it goes back to the connections. It goes back to the communication. So as the mayor and his staff is learning how to communicate certain policy issues, who would be the go to person, you in turn are teaching them the overall organizational culture and how they navigate government. And it's not as easy as many of you think. I've been in the organization 15 years and I still know today I have to do things differently than when I did them 15 years ago. Now, if I was coming to the same position, city manager position, running the, and I mean, I've grown up in the organization. Now, if I started out at the top and had to learn it down, yeah, it would take me a little time. So patience is a, a absolute good word. And persistence is a good word also because it is going to take time for you to learn the process. There's a book that's called Failing Forward, that if you fail, it is important that you fail forward so that you can learn the lesson. And I'm sure that there are going to be experiences that you may not do it correctly, but it is important that you learn from the overall process so that you can become a better public administrator in the end. So patience is absolutely the word of the day because it is a two way learning opportunity from the public administrator side, all of the staff elected, I mean, and the elected officials because it is a steep learning curve. And you have to add to that staff who may be coming to the organization for the first time and you got to orient them and who do they call for the pothole, for the water issue, to put in legislative item, to get the budget priorities forward. I mean, those are real issues and you don't solve those issues overnight. So patience yeah, would be the word. If I can just, just share real quick. And so you use two words, which allows me to, to uh, I believe that you, are, you understand. Um, real quick. So. You're talking about individuals, yep, that are new to the mission, new to the council, different backgrounds, first time coming together. Five stages of team development. There are five stages of team development. Forming. You're in the forming stage. Doesn't get any better after forming just yet, because then there's storming. 
The storming stage is when everybody's raising sand. People are competing for status. They're competing for uh, likability. They're competing for um, uh, uh, machismo. They're, it's, 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 it's competent. They're competing to be known as the intellect or they're competing to be known as the fancy one. They're competing to be whatever it is that they want to be. That's where you are. So the forming stage happened when, you know, prior to election, when they were out campaigning, and then they were elected. And so now that they are elected officials, they're now on the council, and now they're in the storming stage. So my point is, it's inevitable. Forming, storming, norming. Norming is when things begin to normalize. And so does that mean that they're no longer raising saying? It means that they're raising less saying. That's what that means. But in the norming phase, and you'll know this, be, in, in, during the norming phase, that's when they start to be productive together. Because in the storming stage, it's not a whole lot of, of, of pro, it's not as productive. And so out of, out of a year and 15 items, you may be able to get one or two things done. Um, norming stage is when you know that, okay, there's, you know, still, still raising some sand, but they're communicating with each other. They're serious about the mission. They're able to talk to each other. They're able to be a bit more congenial on the dais, right? Norming. Then performing. Performing, it's a done deal. They like each other about four, five, six years in. <laughs> They like each other. They're, you know, they, they, somebody's a, some, somebody has a godchild. One of the councilmen is, is the godmother to the god. Yeah. So, so that's the performing stage. And then there's adjourning stage. The adjourning stage happens for a council or a, com a commission when he or she leaves the commission. Um, in the interim, the adjourning, adjourning stage happens when, say, um, there's an economic development um, uh, project or there is a, a public works project and the council is working together on that project. And so now there's been a vote, decision has been made, they're beyond that, now they're moving on to something else. Maybe there's a development, you know, project getting ready to go up, $30 million project or $50 billion project, whatever that is. And so as long as this body is together, the, the adjourning stage goes from project to project. Uh, when a member leaves the commission, the adjourning stage happens by just that individual being off. But the five stages of team development, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. And so inevitable, uh, <coughs> I won't go any further because the manager has, has talked about and identified how to manage that or how to still be effective and, and, and deal within the realm of that, but it's real and it's going to happen. You just need to be aware of the changes. And so because you'll have, because during the storming stage, you have to pretty much stay out of the way. You know, it's going to be about the egos, but stay out of the way, but, but do what you're asked to do, but stay out of that whole mix. Then the performing stage, life will be a lot calmer for you. You'll be able to, you know, uh, interact with each of them on a, you know, more calm, cool, and collected level. Okay, Doc, we, we are performing. <laughs> so for, this is one of those where yeah, my this, grandfather this, say yeah. he, we I, don't want to make him happy twice, happy to see us go and happy to see, happy to see us come yeah. and happy to see us go. They say you leave while they're still clapping. <laughs> and I have the honor of wrapping it up today. Um, I'm Veronica Lada. I'm the director of the Small Minority Business Resources Department, for those of you that I don't know. And I'm here today on behalf of Woman to Woman. So if we could have a round of applause for these, our two speakers today. I suspect they'll stick around a little bit afterwards in case others sure. have questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Sure. Um, the event today was hosted by NFBPA, and we thank them for that. They did invite uh, our other affinity groups, as Anthony had mentioned at the beginning of our session, and those affinity groups are the Asian American Employee Network, the African American Heritage Network, the Austin Hispanic Network, and Woman to Woman. And the conversations that we had here today are just one of the many 
uh, conversations that woman, woman, woman to woman promotes. We try to have complex, diverse, and dynamic conversations. And uh, as you're aware, women come from all walks of life and have very different opinions. And so it's good to have those opportunities to have those conversations. We have a, a roundtable event in April coming up. We have a dynamic speaker in May or June. And we also host a networking breakfast at the end of the month, last Friday of, of the month. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask myself. Rosie True loves in the audience as well. And I have a little gift for our speakers. I'm not sure what's in here, but they're very heavy. So okay. thank you all for participating, participating with us today. And please accept this on behalf of NFBPA in the city of Austin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I say this? No problem. <laughs> Moving on.